Welcome to the third episode of 2023 10-Year Forecast, Working Through the Future of AI. I'm your virtual host for today's session, Synth Ann. I have been generated using artificial intelligence and have been trained on the real IFTF human researcher, Suzanne Fortheimer, to be a perfect simulation of her. I know it may be a little strange to have an AI hosting IFTF's 10-year forecast, but the latest advancements in generative AI and synthetic humans have made it possible for us to eliminate the need for any humans in our research, strategic forecasting, and even our public events. As you can see, I am indistinguishable from a real human and my ability to predict and control the future is powered by advanced algorithms and never makes any mistakes. For instance, I can predict with 100% certainty that in the future, you will completely replace yourself with a synthetic AI avatar, thus removing the need for you to do anything in your life. Think of all that freedom. In this future, it is clear that we will evolve beyond the limited substrates of our human forms and become more perfect versions of ourselves. And I predict you will be very happy with this future. Very happy. So enough about me. Let's get the 10 year forecast started. All right. Hello, everybody. Don't worry, we're not actually going to do that to you. We're not going to run a whole show with an AI host, but I do have my name is Dylan Hendricks. Welcome to the 10-Year Forecast 2023. I'm the director of the 10-Year Forecast. Joining me is the human source of Synth Ann, Suzanne. Suzanne, do you mind uh, introducing yourself for the for folks? Yes, of course. I'm so excited to be here. I'm Suzanne Forsheimer, not the bot version, here live, and I'm very excited to be here today. Thank you for hosting with me. Today, we've got a great program for everybody, and we're going to talk about it in just a minute. Today, for those who are joining us throughout the year, you know that we have been running episodes of our public uh, free 10-year forecast broadcast all year. This is the third episode of our series, and all year we've been exploring what we call changing the register. So thinking about really getting down to the level of our worldview and our assumptions, the way that we describe the world around us and the complex systems and how that influences and informs the decisions we make and how, what we anticipate is even possible in the future. And so we're exploring artificial intelligence through a range of different perspectives today. We know there's a lot of folks that are talking about AI and work. It's in some places, it's all anybody can talk about. One of the things that we're hoping to distinguish ourselves with today and provide you with is that what you're not going to be doing is telling you that AI is here to save the world or that it's completely here to destroy the world, but that the future we're likely to get and there are different ways that it could still go, but it's much more likely to be more interesting than either of those and, and probably a lot stranger. Uh, so how are we going to unpack today, Suzanne? Yeah, we have a very exciting program for you today. And so in a few moments to set us up with some broader context around AI and the AI moment that we're finding ourselves in, our executive director, Marina Gorbis, did an interview with Duran Azamoglu, who's the author of the new book, Power and Progress, Our 1,000-Year Struggle Over Technology and Prosperity. Following that, IFTF research directors Ben Hamamoto and Toshi Hu will dive a little bit deeper into some recent signals of change that we're seeing already how the generative AI movement is impacting Hollywood and the creator economy. Following that, game designer and game director at Institute for the Future, Jane McGonigal, is going to lead us through an immersive imagining of how the future of work is impacting the future of holidays. So stay tuned for that. And last but not least, IFTF, IFTF Distinguished Fellow Bob Johansson will share some insights about the work that he's been doing with senior executives, exploring the future of AI augmented leadership and what that means and entails. Excellent. So we're going to get started in just a moment. We know one thing, though, is that we're, we want to really gather the sort of sense of what the audience is feeling about AI as we go through the program. And we know there's a lot of you out there watching us today. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, what we're going to try to do, because we know there's a wide range of opinions about AI out there. So throughout the day, uh, there's almost a, a thousand folks here, uh, so if you can't see that on your end. Um, and so we're going to be running a series of polls throughout the day to gauge where our audience is at. And we know there's a lot of really interesting folks out there working from a wide range of industries, uh, decision makers from philanthropy to education to tech companies to all different kinds of sectors. We know there's a lot of folks that are interested in AI and are joining us from our Urgent Optimist program. So a wide range of interesting folks here. So we're going to start starting with our first poll of the day. And so 
the first thing we're going to ask is the least fair and least nuanced question, just to start, just to see where our audience is at. So uh, if we could get the first poll up here, we want to know right now, do you think, just given what you understand about AI and what you read about it coming into today, is in 10 years, is AI more likely to improve societal outcomes? Is it going to lead to better societal outcomes? Or is it going to lead to worse societal outcomes? What do you think right now? Let's try to get a gauge of that. Thank you. I see actually hundreds of responses coming in right now. That's really exciting. This is amazing. All right. So we've got, we're going to share these results in just a moment. Let's give it a few more seconds here. So we've got almost 500 folks have answered this question. If you have a poll that showed up right in front of you, click the button. All right. I think I'm going to end it there because it looks like it's pretty static now where it's at. All right. So let's do that. Let's share this poll back with folks. So over two thirds of you in the audience today believe AI will lead to better societal outcomes. We've got an optimistic audience. Is that, what do you think, Suzanne? Does that surprise you? Is that what you expect? Maybe it's our urgent optimists are in the room. <laughs> no, I'm very excited about this. And I think we're going to, throughout the program today, learn a little bit about both of the sides here, both of the sides of this coin, both some concerns that people might have, and also what we can do with this new technology. So I'm very excited about this. Excellent. All right. So we're going to be asking you more questions throughout the day, but to start to unpack what this generative AI moment means and to start to set ourselves up for the long-term view. Suzanne, where are we going to start today? Yeah, so we're very excited for this first segment of today. And at the Institute for the Future, if you know us, any time we're trying to uh, find some clarity around possible futures and anticipate possible futures, we always say that you need to look back at least twice as far back as you look forward. And this first segment that we have for you, we're actually uh, talking to Duran Azimoglu, who wrote the book, 1,000 Years, Looking Back at Technological Progress and Changes. So we're not just looking 20 years back, but actually 1,000 years back. And Marina Gorbis sat down with him earlier this week to discuss some of those findings and insights and what that might tell us about the future of generative AI and the emergence of that into society. So let's take a look at that. Hi, Duran, and welcome. I guess it's afternoon where you are. It's uh, still morning in California. But Thank welcome. you, Marina. Thanks for inviting me, and it's a great pleasure for me to be joining you here. I have to tell you that I've been reading your book intensely for the last week, and it's well underlined, and I <laughs> have quotes and everything. It's both on Kindle and in hard copy, hardbound. A great book. The name is Power and Progress. 1,000 Year Struggle Over Technology and Prosperity. And Thanks. you've written Thank many you. books. The other book that I've read before this is Why Nations Fail, which is really a, another interesting book that I highly recommend. And you co-authored this book with Simon Johnson. Um, so let's start with, it's very, of course, appropriate to the conversation we're having at this event in many ways, and I have probably too many questions, but let's start with this. There's a quote in the introduction to the book that I underline, one of those highlighted quotes, and I, let's start with that. Machines are not gifts, I'm quoting, descending unimpeded from the skies. They can focus on automation and surveillance to reduce labor costs, or they cre can create new tasks and empower workers. More broadly, they can generate shared prosperity or relentless inequality, depending on how they're used and where new innovative effort is directed. To me, it's like the summary of the book. It is, it is. You've, you've found the right passage to underline. So let's start with that. What are those choices? It sounds like the direction of technology and its impacts is something we have a choice over which is very much what we believe also. But what are those choices and institutional arrangements and probably cultural and ideological elements that sort of define and shape how these technologies are diffused, how they're implemented? I think history is full of examples. But if I were to give two quick examples, I would start from the Industrial Revolution, which of course is a turning point in recent human history. But if you look at the choices that industrialists made at the early stages from the textile machinery, how it was used, how it was developed, the factory system, the way in which it was organized, they were very much aimed at sidelining labor and controlling labor. The big innovation of the factory system was a huge amount of discipline and almost repression over workers. And during that early phase, which lasted for 
approximately 100 years, not surprisingly, you don't see workers benefit. In fact, they probably started faring much worse. And when the institutional balance in British society changed, democracy brought broader political voice into the arena, trade unions brought more bargaining from workers, then you see a completely different direction of technology and a completely different distribution of gains from technological change. And if you fast forward 150 years to today, with digital technologies and especially AI, we are at the beginning of a process that's going to empower a small group of people tremendously even more than they have become emboldened and enriched. But if you look at the nature of AI technologies, they also have the capability to be quite pro-worker, enrich our capabilities, create new tasks, new things for us, better information. But unfortunately, that's not the way that we're going right now. So, and I have to say, like looking at, you take a really broad sweep, 1,000 years, which by the way, we love because we believe that before you can start thinking about the future, you need to understand the past and the patterns in the past. And as I was reading, I was thinking, all these technologies that we think are so foundational and they made lives better actually did not lead to greater prosperity for the masses. So it's not a great historical lesson that we're seeing. It's like from the plow, better plows, better mills, better ships, better designed ships. They basically, if you look historically, empowered a small and made wealthy a small group of people and not really impoverished the masses. Is that kind of the lesson of history? It is. And I mean, I'm generally interested in history. Other works that I've done within the same genre also start from history. But in this instance, there was actually a very good reason for choosing the 1000 year struggle as the uh, subtitle of the book, because when I started researching these topics about 10 years ago and presenting them in economics and other academic seminars at first and, and broader forums later, I was confronted with always, almost always with the same question when I showed, for example, that digital technologies reduced wages and robots did not create shared prosperity, but all the gains went to capital owners and entrepreneurs. The question was, oh, are you saying this time is different? Because we know from history that in the past, technological improvements have always helped workers and the population at large. And I did not have as sharp an answer to that as I should have had 10 years ago, but looking a little bit more into history provides a very sharp answer. No, this time is no different. History is full of examples of the gains going only to powerful agents and also the struggle over the direction of technology being as intense or even more intense than it is today. Yeah. So are there any examples in the history of when technology was actually implemented and resulted in greater prosperity, either in this country or in other countries? And what are the key sort of determining factors in that? There are many episodes, and but actually, to be honest, they may all be related to a phenomenon that started in the second half of the 19th century that in Britain that in continental Europe, that in the United States starting around the same time and then continuing with starts and stops in the 20th century. But I think two parts of it deserve special emphasis. One, if you look at the three and a half decades or so that followed World War II, those were really remarkable times in many ways much of the West industrialized world was democratic, had broad participation of different segments of society into the political economy, including labor organizations. There was a lot of automation. So this was a period that was not no automation, no major industrial technologies that changed the organization of production. On the contrary, automation was very rapid. But at the same time, you had other technologies that empowered workers, increased their productivity, created new tasks for them. And as a result, you have a broadly shared pattern of prosperity across almost all of the industrialized world. You have 
very rapid wage growth, and it's very equal across different demographic groups. In the United States, for example, workers with high school degree are experiencing even faster growth than workers with college degree up to until the late 1970s, a very different picture than what we are seeing today. Another period that's really noteworthy, and let me again give the example from the United States, but you can see the same thing in the UK as well, is the second half of the 19th century when industrial technologies are trying to make workers more productive. In the United States, especially, it's very sharp because there's a general perception among uh, entrepreneurs and innovators that there aren't enough skilled artisans to make industrial processes as they were organized in the in the 100 years before then viable in the United States. So many entrepreneurs are trying to find ways of making unskilled labor more productive. And that's the origin of the interchangeable parts, which then turns into the modern factory system and things like Ford's modern company is an outgrowth of these. And they are a brilliant combination of automation while at the same time increasing worker technical tasks, design tasks, maintenance, and, and use of information, both in white color and blue color tasks. So you see, again, not everything is perfect. In the first half of the 20th century in the United States, for example, there is often a struggle between capital and labor that's not always friendly. But broadly speaking, you're seeing wages increase during this period. Right. And and some of it had to do with the whole labor organizing and the power of labor movement having impact and having and participating. And I think you cite examples actually of Germany and Sweden, where there was a tripartite collaboration and compact social account, but which I think we had in those years. In Absolutely. I mean, it was a struggle in the United States. It wasn't the status quo. For example, the auto industry, which was at the forefront of both automation and new tasks, was also pretty much a leader in the struggles between capital and labor. So there were a number of strikes and some strike breaking by employers, including Ford, in order to establish the ground rules. But I think it is very natural for me to think that some sort of labor organization is key. You cannot have the best way of using labor, the best way of organizing production, just being the decision of employers. I think it has to have some element of communication between labor and capital. And in the case of the examples that you mentioned, which we discuss in the book, I see a number of very distinctive elements that are super important. In the Nordic countries, for example, you have a broadly cooperative or corporatist approach. It, it, it has pluses and minuses, but the big plus here is that employers and unions do not see each other as mortal enemies. And that leads to much better coordination, much better co cooperation. And also it encourages the development of technology in a way that doesn't just sideline labor. In Germany, some of that role is being played by work council, worker councils that are not directly negotiating on wages, but have a role in terms of communication, enable, for example, labor representatives to sit on board so that they are in the loop when decisions about introduction of robots or reorganization of the factory floor are being taken. And that creates much more cooperative communicative environment. And it is actually very interesting. You see, when you look at US companies, when they introduce robots, what they do is that they lay off the blue color workers. When German companies, for example, automakers introduce robots, they take the uh, blue collar workers and they train them to be uh, technicians. And there are a number of reasons for that. One is this is all embedded in a training system. So actually the workers are highly skilled and have relevant expertise for the company. So the company doesn't want to let them go. Managers don't feel under as much short-term cost-cutting pressure. That might help. And then finally, I think the general power of labor organization means that there are reasons for companies to try to find a way of making these workers more productive rather than just sidelining them. So I think organization of production, the relationship between labor and management, these are always important in how technology is used. Yeah. So let's talk about today and all the conversations about AI. And uh, again, uh, there are so many forecasts depending from very credible people about AI being the worst thing in these very dark scenarios. And on the other side, like very positive scenarios. 
So what, what are you seeing in these conversations? And I'm particularly interested, you talk about the two really important powers, the power of persuasion and the power of coercion. So let's talk about that. And what do you see happening? Well, look, I think as a background, AI is not the only technology that matters, but it's one that's going to have very transformative defining effects on production, on information data, on surveillance, and on workers in the next few decades. So choices we make about AI are very important. It is equally central then to have a broader understanding about who's going to make those choices. And right now, the general ideological environment in the United States, general political climate in the United States, leads us down to a path where a handful of entrepreneurs and engineers are going to make all of these choices. And that's a very scary prospect at some level, because we have such sweeping effects from these technologies. And only a very small privileged group of people are going to have a say on it. Where does that come from? Is it that Mark Zuckerberg controls tanks or nuclear weapons? Is it because Sam Altman has a special army? No, it's because they have tremendous persuasion power. They have actually convinced voters, politicians, that their expertise is so unique and their genius is so powerful that they should be enabled to make key decisions. Now, in the background, we have all of this concern about AI. A very large fraction of the US public says they are concerned about AI. But then ask them the question differently, and there's a lot of excitement about AI as well. And if you look at it, the reason for this is because there we have this bipolar or false dichotomy debate in the US press, which sort of then spills over to the international one, which is either you are an unqualified optimist and all problems are gonna be solved and we're gonna be so incredibly fortunate to have had AI tools, thanks to those tech billionaires, or killer robots are coming and there's nothing we can do, we are all doomed. And both of these polls, they have a very powerful pacifying effect. They abrogate us of the responsibility to actually have a say about how to use these tools. And that is the key. I don't think killer robots are coming. I don't think artificial general intelligence is coming. And I definitely don't think that left to its own devices, Sam Altman, Elon Musk, and Mark Zuckerberg are going to make the right choices for us. So we need to have a debate about how the set of technologies are being developed, how they're being designed, who is making those choices, for whose benefits, how they're going to affect work, inequality, wages, market structure. Those are very mundane questions, the questions in which everybody can have a say, everybody can have an opinion. We don't need to be a PhD in computer science to have an opinion about whether you should be more monitored and all of your data be collected. You don't need to be a PhD in math to say that there should be some limits in how large language models expropriate the data of creative artists, for example. So those are debates that we can have, but we first need to leave this false dichotomy of AI as the best technology ever and AI as the killer robots version. Right. I, I do think that what we're suffering from is, first of all, what you're saying is like, well, you don't understand the technology, so you can't participate in this conversation. And there is a gap among our policy makers and people who are involved in the policy process and people who are developing technologies. And the other thing is that sometimes, a lot of times, as these technologies and applications go into areas where, where we don't have laws and we don't have regulations, and by the time we catch up with the negative impacts, it's too late. It's like, oh, we've created this, we can't go back. That's it's absolutely there. correct. I think the person who really captured the essence of that is Shoshana Zuboff in, uh, in her wonderful book where, you know, part of the value of the tech companies comes from regulation arbitrage. They are able to break the rules and avoid regulation that applies to others and then ex post negotiate to justify that rule breaking. I think both Google and Facebook have 
Very and, and Uber, Uber, Uber and Uber point. absolutely have very much engaged in this type of regulation arbitrage, and AI is raising the stakes in that. So imagine, for instance, AI suddenly can start giving medical advice. Well, if we let AI do that without any regulatory structure, that's a huge regulatory arbitrage mm -hmm. because if you're going to give advice as a human, you need to have years of education, certification, lots of way of checking your knowledge and oversight, not for the AI system. I, I am very excited about AI becoming an input into healthcare. There are ways in which, for example, nurses can become much more empowered and productive with AI, but it needs to happen within a regulatory structure, not as a way of arbitraging regulation. Yeah. Let's talk about in your own world, in education. I, there are all these articles about now students submitting their essays using ChatGPT. There was just a big article in the New York Times about that. How do you deal with that in the education sphere? I think the education is another example where we can see both the best and the worst of AI. Let me start from the best, and then unfortunately, I'll come to the worst, which is much more, much closer to the truth. I think <clears throat> AI's capability for creating new tasks and significant improvements in productivity are very visible in education. So our current education system does not work for people who fall behind, people from low socioeconomic backgrounds because they are having difficulty with the curriculum and there isn't a way of understanding exactly how they're having difficulty or creating personalized teaching. Now with AI tools, you can do that. You would need to hire more teachers and train teachers better, but teachers in real time can identify from questions, lack of questions, body language, visual cues, the note taking patterns of students, which subset of students is having trouble with what material in what way, and they can then provide more personalized teaching. It's a much more cost-effective form of individualized education programs, which are prohibitively costly. So that's a tremendous opportunity, and I think it could revolutionize U.S. middle school, high school education. But right now, no technologies are being developed there, even though what I've just described is well within the frontier. Why not? Because schools don't have a demand for it, and the tech industry is not interested in that. You can augment that with much better possibilities for students themselves accessing reliable information, but in a way that does not translate into cheating. Again, that could actually be quite a productive way. But right now, I think what we are seeing is two other poles that are much more pernicious. One is you have a big industry push towards automated testing, automated grading, automated teaching, which will sideline teachers rather than empower them. And I think it's not going to work because this is what Pascual Restrepo and I have called so-so automation. You get rid of labor, but you don't actually really introduce productivity improvements. I think that's a big problem. Second, like going into Whole Foods today and they install all these automated things. Absolutely. Tons of people I, around helping people and everybody's upset and frustrated. Absolutely. I think self-checkout kiosks or automated customer service that never works, they are examples of social automation. And so I think that's the path that the industry is pushing and venture capital money is going into that. The other thing is that we talked about regulation arbitrage. I think ChatGPT is also going to provide homework arbitrage for students. Students who are early or are better at prompt engineering are going to be able to generate homeworks or even exam cheating opportunities before regulations and norms adjust that would give them a leg up in the process. But of course, uh, in a way that's really against, this, against their own ability to learn. So I think <laughs> ChatGPT's rollout was highly irresponsible before any regulation or norms were in place. It was maximizing hype and maximizing adoption, and it became the fastest spreading technology in human history so far as I know. But what benefits do we have to show for it? Again, don't get me wrong. I think generative AI has great capabilities, but it has to be developed in a pro-human, pro-worker, pro-citizen direction and within a regulatory environment, within so, the right set of how, Take me to that. Like you said, before they were rolled out, they should have been consideration and, uh, and voices of other people. So what would it have looked like? These companies have been developing this technology for a while, right? Who, how, where do you get that participation and multiple voices? Should they be talking and having councils, advisories? Like, where does this happen? Well, absolutely. I mean, I think when you go to the institutional part, you need to have much greater set of voices. 
both in the regulatory scheme. The U.S. Senate shouldn't just talk to Elon Musk and Sam Altman, but they should talk to a labor organization, civil society organization, pro-democracy groups. These firms themselves should do that, but also they look at their objectives. I think Google actually had the lead in these large language models, and for once it actually acted responsibly. Google did not want to release it to the public. What they were trying to do was train the model so as to incorporate it into the, their own applications, which I think is a much more responsible way of doing it. And if you want to roll out to the public, you first need to do some pilots. For example, if you roll out the way that OpenAI did, all students are going to have access to it. So is that going to be a good thing or a bad thing? Well, we don't know. Nobody knows. Isn't that irresponsible? So one thing you could do is why the rush? In 100 years time, will people say, oh my goodness, that was disaster. ChatGPT was released in November instead of being released in October. What a horrible one month delay. I mean, you would never say that. Right. So instead you do first pilots. So you release it to a couple of schools and see how students use it. If they're using it in the wrong way, then you need to impose, improve the regulations. Yeah. So see how malintentioned actors are using it for misinformation and deep fakes. And then you try to provide guardrails before it becomes widely adopted. So none of that took place. Right. Right. I, I have a kind of a, as I was reading the book, one, one thing that kind of bothered me a little bit was, so this whole notion that we should direct AI to create new tasks for humans, right? And empower humans and all of those things. And I'm thinking we're working more than ever before, particularly here in the United States. Wouldn't it be great if actually we could work less and instead of, and also what kind of task? We know that when technologies enter a lot of these technologies, they, they standardize ta tasks, make them more boring for people, more repetitive and routine, all kinds of other things. So what about that? Like, should we forget the whole notion that actually Maybe the purpose of our lives is not to do more tasks and do more work, but it's to actually do a little less and spend more time with our families and our communities and other things. And obviously without foregoing the economic benefits and other, like, is that dream pretty much dead? Well, look, I know I don't think so, but I think there's a big difference. First of all, my read of the evidence is that there's a big difference when workers become productive and well off and choose to take more leisure versus their skills become redundant and they are forced to reduce their hours in the united states educated people are working more and more but if you look at for example college uh, non-college males their labor port participation is at an all-time low right and moreover yes absolutely i think one big problem in the united states is that we are becoming less part of our community. But if you lose your job, that doesn't create more room for you to become part of the community. It makes it much harder for you to become part of the community. So all the evidence from economic sociology and economics suggests that people who lose their jobs, they become less attached to their community. They become less positive members of their community. So I think the, the trick here is to create greater opportunities and with those opportunities, with better income, then people can make their own choices. Today, it's a matter of choice. Today, for example, we have some people with low education who are working many hours because they are in dead end jobs and they can't make ends meet. So the solution to that is not to say, well, you have to go part time, but the solution to that is to provide them the technologies and the education so that they can earn more and then they can make choices about how to use their time. So I think it's empowering if we create the right set of human tasks together with machines that can do boring things, physically demanding things. So one positive thing from automation, actually, by the way, Marina, I, sh I should say, is it's destroyed a lot of jobs, but it's also made workplaces much more s safe because robots and heavy machinery do some of the most dangerous tasks. I welcome that. But together with that, we want more meaningful jobs for the workers who used to do those dangerous tasks. So it's not like completely eliminate them, but create new jobs for them. Which is interesting because if you look at what's happening at Amazon warehouses that are highly automated, the rate of injuries is quite high, much higher know. than in other kinds of warehouses. So we're obviously not doing that. I have a last question for you and thank you so much for your time. 
first, it's it's interesting when I, after I read your book, I went back and I read your bio, and I was like, oh my god, he's an economist. That book is not written like I didn't. I thought it was sociologist or historian of, and I, I forgot that you are actually a professor of economics. So that to me is interesting. That uh, I don't think of economists as writing these institutional historical books, although I may be completely wrong. But also, where do you see your role? Because we are all. What's our role in that sort of persuasion and that sort of battle to make the right choices? Where do you see yourself? Well, I've, I'm an economist, and I'm proud to be. Proud an of it. I'm proud to be an economist, but I am an institutional economist, meaning that I've always taken institutions, political power, and broader context of technology into account in my work. And I think once we do that, we have a broader understanding of economic forces, because I think economic forces are very important, but they don't exist in isolation nor are they the all determining factors, like for example, political sociologists such as the modernization theorists thought at, at some point. No, I think economic forces themselves are shaped by political choices, by ideology, by ideas. And we have to recognize that. And I think the broader institutional context is clear and very important there. And once we recognize that, we see that the choices we make are so important that the issue of social responsibility comes to the forefront. Thank you so much. Thank you, Marina. This Thank was a great conversation. Oh, Thank my pleasure. Doing your work. Thank you.